Good morning. Welcome. We're glad to have you here this morning. Welcome to another version of Jesus and Jeans. Worship at the Cottage. Uh, we're having some internet issues today, so uh, just want to let everybody know uh, if you're recording. Jan, please turn the camera this way. Hello. That's that internet problem again. That's right. You were on my number but uh, we're having some internet issues today, so we've been trying to get that squared away. For some reason, it's, it's not working. So if you're watching us via the internet, we want to encourage you to go to our ar archive <laughs> a little later on. But uh, my name is Teddy Baker, along with my wife Jan, Jim and Sandra Penner. This is a, a ministry to you guys that we, we do every week, and we just are, are so appreciative that you uh, show up and and be with us uh, every Sunday. It's a pretty cool thing. We're going to do some, uh, today is a Memorial Day weekend, and uh, tomorrow is more Memorial Day, so uh, our, our message is geared toward that this morning. So we're going to do a little singing here, all right? My country is of the sweet land of liberty, of the ice.
a little time in prayer uh, this morning. We got several uh, prayer requests. Uh, I want you to remember uh, Jerry Murchison. Uh, he's uh, one of the guys and families from uh, uh, Paradise Valley is uh, is in the hospital uh, this morning and uh, so we want to certainly remember him uh, in prayer. Um, want to remember Becca. We have a just a unspoken prayer request for her and uh, health issues and so I want to uh, remember her as well as uh, Jim and, and Barbara Hires, uh, my mom and dad. They, Barbara is uh, hanging in there and, and still fighting a good fight uh, with this leukemia that she has. And uh, so just ask you to keep all of them uh, in, your, in your prayers today. I'm sure we have other unspoken prayer requests that we have this morning. And uh, so we'll lift all those up to the Father and uh, just ask his blessings on our time together this morning. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you, God, for this day. This is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And Father, we lift up our, our prayers to you this morning, knowing that 
that you hear them because we are your children and because you are present in this place. We pray your blessings over our brother Jerry and for Becca and for uh, mom and dad, Jim and Barbara Hires. And, and Father, any of the other prayer requests that uh, may be present in this room today, God, you know about them already. And so we pray your blessing and your intervention and everyone. Some, Father, we need you as the great physician uh, to bring healing to the body, uh, to the spirit. And others, fathers, we need we need the counselor to come alongside us and and to walk with us and to just feel your spirit there, to feel that peace that passes all understanding. We thank you today, Father, especially for Memorial Day, where we can remember those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate payment for the freedom that we have. And as we look at the men and women of, of the military of uh, just all of our special forces, uh, even the, the men and women uh, of our local uh, police forces and uh, fire departments and first responders. God, we just pray your blessings over them who have given their lives in service for this country. We love you, Lord. We thank you every single day for every day that you give us, for being able to gather together to worship in spirit and in truth. We ask your blessings this morning, Lord, in the powerful name of your son, Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Well, today we're going to be uh, looking in the book of John in chapter 15. And we're going to be focusing on uh, one verse. We're looking at verses 12 and 13, which are my favorite verses for Memorial Day. Uh, because the verses say this. Jesus is speaking to the disciples, and he says, this is the commandment that I give you. This is the command, that you love one another. And then he goes on to say, Greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for a friend. And today as we talk about honoring Memorial Day, how do we do that? And we're going to talk through that this morning. As I said earlier, tomorrow is Memorial Day, and it's a, a, a day that we've set aside for remembering the people who paid the ultimate price for our freedom. Memorial Day in America goes way back to the Civil War. In the beginning, it was called Decoration Day because the men and women would gather together to decorate the graves of soldiers with flowers and flags. In the South, ladies gathered. They gathered to put flowers on the graves of the men both north and south who had died during the Civil War. On May 30th, 1868, Major General John Logan declared May 30th to be a day for honoring soldiers who had died fighting for the North. And then in 1971, it was declared that Memorial Day was to be observed on the last Monday in May. And the purpose of Memorial Day today is, is to honor our nation's military personnel and some of the folks that have been added all over the years. Like I said, folks that are work with our police departments, our first responders, our fire departments, our, uh, any of those folks that are associated in those areas. And we certainly want to do that today. This morning I want to share with you three ways that, that we can honor Memorial Day. Because for most of us, it's the beginning of summer. We're ready to break out the grills, get the barbecue going, start working on the tan. Well, most of you, you begin a little early with that, with the, with the tanning beds. <laughs> but we especially want to pay tribute, again, to those who have paid the ultimate price with their lives for the freedom that we have today. The first step that I want to encourage you to take is to look back and remember. Look back and remember the deceased, the ones who have given their lives. The USS New York is an amphibious assault ship. But it's not just any assault ship. Its bow is made out of 24 tons of scrap steel that had been salvaged 
from the World Trade Center. The scrap steel was sent to Louisiana to be melted down and then poured into molds to form the USS New York. Before the steel was melted down, those gruff steel workers would gently touch it as they walked by. They treated that steel with the utmost respect. The ship was finished and christened the New York on March 1st, 2008. The ship was delivered to the Navy on the 21st of August, 2009 at New Orleans. The ship's delivery was accepted by her first commanding officer, Command Commander F. Curtis Jones, U.S. Navy, a native of Binghamton, New York. And she set sail for Norfolk, Virginia on the 13th of October, 2009. And on the 2nd of November, 2009, the ship passed the World Trade Center site for the first time and gave the site a 21-gun salute. You see, the New York was designed to be a new class of warship. It's, it's designed for missions that include special oper operations against terrorists. It carries a crew of 360 sailors and 700 combat-ready Marines to be delivered ashore by helicopters and assault craft. And the ship's motto is this, never forget. Almost sounds like a grudge, doesn't it? But I think it's different than that. I think it fits right in with the reason that we celebrate a Memorial Day. We must not forget what has happened in the past. Because if we don't remember the things that led up to our past tragedies, then we won't recognize when they're about to happen again. We owe it to those who have given their lives to remember. We owe it to our children to remember so that they can be safe and so that they too can be free. Setting aside days or objects of remembrance really are, are nothing new. There are many of them, both in the, in the Hebrew and the Greek scriptures, for a variety of practices and for a variety of practical purposes. For example, in Genesis 9, 8 through 17, God established the rainbow as a sign of his covenant with Noah, that he would not flood the earth again to destroy all flesh. It was a reminder of both God's judgment in the past and His promise for the future. In Exodus 12 and 13, the Lord brings about His last plague upon Egypt, which resulted in Pharaoh finally releasing the, the children of Israel from their enslavement. The firstborn would be killed unless the blood of a lamb was spread on the doorpost and the lintel, in which case the angel of death would pass over that house. The Lord then established the Feast of Passover as a yearly reminder of this event and the freedom that resulted from it. In Joshua 3 records the miraculous crossing of the Jordan River on dry ground. God directed the Levites to carry the Ark of the Covenant into the river. And as their feet touched the river, the water stopped flowing and the riverbed became dry. A man from each tribe then collected a large stone from the middle of the riverbed. And these were stacked on the opposite side of the Jordan River as a, memo a memorial. And the purpose was specifically so that when future generations of children would ask about the stacked stones, the story of the crossing could be retold. It was important to remember their history. The book of Esther records the plot of Haman, a high official in the king's court to annihilate the Jews living in Persia. The plot was reversed by the efforts of Queen Esther, and the Feast of Purim, 
which is still celebrated to this day, was established to remember the story. The same is true in our own society. There are particular days of remembrance, such as today and tomorrow. There are particular sites of remembrance, such as cemeteries and battlefields and museums. There are particular objects to cause remembrance, such as um, monuments and historical signs. And there are songs and ballads and books and poetry about things that should be remembered. And Memorial Day, Veterans Day, the 4th of July, are set as memorials for what God has done for us as a nation as well as the cost to become America. Land of the free, home of the brave. There's a quote that says America is the land of the free because it's the home of the brave. Why do we need memorials? Why do we need to look back and remember? Because it says in Deuteronomy 6, verses 12 through 15, it says, Beware, this is from the, the King Jimmy. <laughs> it says, Beware lest you forget God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. One of the main reasons that we need memorials is because we have such short memories. <laughs> they say that a goldfish has a memory that lasts only about 30 seconds. I'm running a close second to that myself. <laughs> That means that every time the goldfish swims around the pond, they're always amazed at all the new stuff they're discovering. <laughs> it's kind of like Dory. You may, you've seen the movie Dory, you know? <laughs> Disney movie? I feel like that sometimes. <laughs> and although the life of a goldfish may be continuously new and exciting, I don't recommend that for people. <laughs> and especially not for nations. And I, I'm getting to the place these days that I, I have to write everything down so that I, I don't forget to do it. And now my biggest problem is finding all those little pieces of paper that I've really stepped out. <laughs> you see, after, after we've prayed and God has delivered us and the danger is all past, it's just easy to forget all about his help and his blessings. One of the things that I used to do is I used to journal a lot. I used to write down the things, not only prayers, but how God answered those prayers. How God impacted my life. And it created for me what I call spiritual markers. That I could look back over my life and see where God intervened and answered prayer. Some prayers may be not answered right at that moment, but how God worked in my life so that I continually remember what He has done in my life so that the next time I face an obstacle, a problem in my life, all I have to do is look back to see what He's already done and to be able to walk forward in faith to say, Lord, I don't understand it, but I believe and I trust you. And one of the things that I want you to understand is that having a memorial is not saying that we should be living in the past. That's not what a, a memorial is for. A memorial is there to help us remember an important lesson so we don't make the same mistake again. Or a memorial is put there to help us to remember an important event when something special has happened. 
The lives given up for the cost of our freedom is certainly worthy of our remembrance. The second step that I'd encourage you to, to do is not only look back and remember the deceased, but also to look out and love the living. You see, that's what our loved ones died for. How many stories have you heard of men and women who were so moved by compassion because of some of the things that had happened? A guy named Pat Tillman who was who, who gave up a, a professional football career, making millions a year to go be a specialist in the Army. Although he was killed by, by friendly fire, he, he gave up his life. He gave up everything. He and his brother, his brother was signed to a, a Major League Baseball contract. And they both signed up the same day to go and fight because of the compassion they felt in their hearts to go serve their country. They looked out and they loved. They were willing to give their lives so that we may live. And we must look out to those around us and love them. Look out and love the living. And we need to love people around us while we still can. Colossians 3, 12 through 14 says this, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. Put up with one another. And forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Paul is saying instead of fighting with each other, we must forgive one another. That's one of the most powerful one another's in the Bible. Forgive one another. And we must demonstrate that love any way that we can. One of the greatest ways to do that is just the power of prayer. Acts 10, 4, Cornelius, there in, in, in the book of Acts, he was, he was interested in becoming a, a believer. He wasn't a believer, but he had summoned Peter to come and, and talk to him. And Cornelius stared at this angel, came to visit Cornelius. And the Bible says that Cornelius stared at him with fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. And the angel answered this way. He said, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. The power of prayer. This is, listen to what Max Lucado says. I love some of the writings of Max Lucado. Max Lucado says this, the power of prayer is not in the one praying, but in the one who hears our prayers. With all the division that is happening in our nation, with all the, the discourse and the, the vitriol that, that we see happening every day in the news media, one thing that stands out as a way to support our nation and its leaders is the power of prayer. I tell you guys all the time, we don't have to be twins to be brothers and sisters. We can agree to disagree. I don't like some colors. I don't like boiled okra. <laughs> Guess what? That's okay. <laughs> I can eat me some fried or <laughs> But there are a lot of things that I don't like, but it, it's, it's not a wedge, you know. It's not a wedge between my relationship with people. Here's the thing. 
for me, especially in the day that we live, it's, it's not about being a Republican or a Democrat. It's not about being a conservative or a liberal. It's about recognizing the forces that are out there that are there for one purpose, and that is to destroy the American way of life. Over the past 70 years or so, a group and a movement called secularism has become this radical form of influence in the lives of, of young and old, especially in, in America. It's, it's worldwide, but it's especially in America. And some of the results begin in 1962. In 1962, prayer in schools was declared illegal. The next year, in 1963, Bible reading in schools was declared illegal. 1980, declared illegal to post the Ten Commandments in the schools. And you see, this movement is out to destroy the, the secular world around us is even more engaged in removing and outraged, literally outraged by our Christian values. It is only through the power of prayer that we can stand firm in our Christian heritage and belief while still being able, as the Bible says, to love our enemies. And it is a war. It is a battle that we fight every single day. A faithful Christian soldier went to his chaplain for advice. Last night, he said, I, when I knelt by my bed and prayed, the fellows began to ridicule me and throw shoes at me. What should I do? Well, said the chaplain, why don't you just stop kneeling down? Just lie in bed and lift your heart to God in silence and, and he will hear you. And after a few days, the chaplain asked the soldier how he was faring with his evening prayers. I'll tell you, Reverend, I followed your advice for three nights. But my conscience began to bother me because I, was, I felt like I was betraying my Lord. So I began to kneel down as I did before. And what happened, asked the chaplain. The soldier said, I was, I was really amazed. Not a single fellow ridiculed me. Now the 15 men in my tent kneel down with me and I pray aloud for all of them. Never underestimate the power of prayer. When you do business with God, God will do business in the world around you. It's not just going with before Him, you know, with your shopping list. I like this, 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 and I like it. Can I I can have it by 5 o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> now, it is the prayer warriors who are willing to, to, to pray with passion and conviction to call down the, the power of God in a certain situation. And my friends, he's still alive and he still is real and still in the business of setting us all free. I love that about him. And I never take him for granted in that area. I struggle in other areas, but not in that one. I know he will deliver. The third step that I encourage you to take is not only look back and remember, not only look out and love the living, but also to look up and to honor the Lord. God wants us to be a memorial to Him. 
It is part of our DNA as believers. And it's part of our heritage as one nation under God. I want you to listen to the words of French writer Alexis de Tocqueville. He visited America in 1831 and he wrote these words. He said, I sought for the greatness of the United States and her commodious harbors, her ample rivers, her fertile fields and boundless forests, and it was not there. I sought for it in her rich mines, her vast world commerce, her public school system, and her institutions of higher learning, and it was not there. I looked for it in her democratic congress and her matchless constitution, and it was not there. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. America, and if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. One of those things that we remember, you see Donald Trump wasn't the first one to come up with that. <laughs> that idea of making America great again is something that we've been doing for a long time. Because every time that we remember America is good, it makes America great. It's one of the values that I, I try to convey and, and teach you guys all the time is this. That I bear our very lives should be memorials to God. That people should be able to see Jesus in us. Remember the image of the cross. That as we honor our vertical relationship with God, with the Father, it makes our horizontal relationships with others more honorable. As we honor the Father with our lives, it makes the relationships with others more honorable. Able to build those relationships. Able to build bridges instead of walls. You see, that kind of memorial helps to reach out to others with the message of Christ. One of our main functions as believers is to be a living witness to a lost and dying world. We've looked at that over the last several weeks, talking about how to share our faith, how to be a witness in the world. Listen to what Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says. It says, here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. And if I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep an open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God. This generous Father in heaven. Philippians 2, 14 through 16 says this, Do everything readily and cheerfully. No bickering. No second guessing allowed. Go out into the world uncorrupted. 
a breath of fresh air in this squalid and polluted society. Provide people with a glimpse of good living and of the living God. I love that. Provide people with a glimpse of good living and of the living God. Carry the light-giving message into the night so I'll have good cause to be proud of you on the day that Christ returns. Paul is saying, you'll be living proof that I didn't go all of this work, I didn't do all this work for nothing. You see, we all have family members, friends, fellow workers, neighbors, etc., 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 all who need our love. What loving things, what random acts of kindness can you do for them? You see, small or large, our love needs to be demonstrated while they're still living. Send them some flowers while they live. Take them out to dinner. Take out their garbage. Wash their car, mow their grass. I don't care what it is. Do something. But state your love while they're living. Someone once said that a Christian church is a body or a collection of persons voluntarily associated together, professing to believe what Christ teaches, to do what Christ commands, to imitate his example, cherish his spirit, and make known his gospel to others. You see, our business is not to do something for the church. It's to do something with it. You are the church. It's not a building. It's you are where the Holy Spirit of God lives and dwells and makes a difference in the world. It's not a building. Those things are becoming dinosaurs for a long time. It takes a lot of money to keep them going. We don't have that problem. <laughs> But I want you to get that. Our business is not to do something for the church. It's to do something with it. And our lives should be able to express that. Our lives should be a memorial to the world what the Lord has done in us. In 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, it says this from the message. It says, but you are the ones chosen by God Chosen for the high calling of priestly work. Chosen to be a, a holy people. God's instruments to do his work and speak out for it. To tell others of the night and day difference he made for you. From nothing to something. From rejected to accepted. 2 Corinthians 3.2 says, Your very lives are a letter that anyone can read by just looking at you. Have you heard that before? Have you ever heard me say that? Yeah. Live your lives in such a way that people can see Jesus in you. And yes, use words if you have to. <laughs> you see, Christ himself wrote it. <laughs> Not with ink, but with God's living spirit. Not chiseled into stone, but carved into human lives. And we publish it. Do you remember the words that I gave you when we started this message? My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Jesus gave his sinless life so that we who deserve to die could have eternal life with God in heaven. And we should look up and honor him 
in everything that we do because he paid a debt that he did not owe for a debt that we could not pay. Some of you may remember Paul Harvey. He tells a story about an old man who would come to an old broken down pier on the eastern coast of Florida. And every Friday night until his death in 1973, he would come walking slowly and slightly stooped with a, a large bucket of shrimp. And the seagulls would flock to this old man and flock around him and he would feed them every night from his bucket. You see, many years before, in October 1942, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker was on a mission in a B-17 to deliver an important message to General Douglas MacArthur in New Guinea. Somewhere over the South Pacific, the flying fortress became lost. Beyond the reach of radio, and fuel ran dangerously low. And so the men ditched the plane in the ocean. And for nearly a month, Captain Eddie and his companions fought the water, the weather, and the scorching sun. They spent many sleepless nights recoiling at giant sharks rammed their, their rafts. But all of their enemies at sea, one proved most formidable, and that was starvation. Eight days out, their rations were long gone or destroyed by salt water, and it would take a miracle to save them. Then a miracle happened. Listen as Captain Rickenbacker, Rickenbacker tells us a story. He says this, he says, something landed on my head. I knew that it was a seagull. I don't know how I know, but I just knew. Everyone else knew too. No one said a word, but peering out from under my hat brim without moving my head, I could see the expression on their faces. They were staring at that gull because the gull meant food if I could catch it. Well, the rest, as they say, is history. Captain Eddie did catch the gull. They ate its flesh. They used its intestines for bait to catch fish and survived because this one seagull gave its life for them. The survivors were sustained. Their hopes were renewed because a lone seagull, hundreds of miles from land, offered itself as a sacrifice. Captain Eddie never forgot. And so every Friday evening about sunset, on a lonely stretch of the eastern Florida seacoast, you could see an old man walking, white-haired, bushy eyebrows, slightly bent. His bucket was filled with shrimp to feed the gulls. To remember that one, which on a day-long past, gave itself without a struggle. Just as Eddie Rickenbacker never forgot the gull that gave its life, we should never forget the soldiers, men and women of our country who have given up their lives. Eddie got a second chance at life. And because many brave men and women have died in the armed services fighting for our country's freedom, we too have a chance at life, a life of freedom. But remember this, both freedom and life never ever come without a price. I wanna close our service today with a song that I wrote for Memorial Day. 
And if you're ever on uh, YouTube, you can look this up. The song is entitled, At Great Cost. And I wrote this song because as I was thinking one Memorial Day weekend about what the price, the price that, that people paid for God and for country. And immediately the men and the women of our military came to my mind. And then the one who paid the ultimate sacrifice is Jesus Christ who set us all free. And so as I, I sing this song again for another Memorial Day, I want you to think about those who have given and paid the ultimate price. And I want you to think about Christ who literally paid the ultimate price for our freedom. That we may live truly one nation under God. Shed his grace on thee. We paid the price through sacrifice to keep our nation free. All gave some and some gave all to bravely walk this side. They cry out the call. Of freedom, one nation under God. At great cost, they gave their lives for stars and stripes for you and me. At great cost, they bled and died. And so that we could be free It was for freedom that they gained They suffered such great love This freedom that we share Was at great One day a man hung on a tree His name was Jesus Christ He died that we might all live free From sin and death and strife And our fathers died believing That we'd find against all lives and in his name we could be free one nation under God at great call he gave his life he paid the price for you and me at great We shall truly be healed. It was for freedom that we gained. We suffered such great love. This freedom that we share was that. suffered such great love this freedom that we share is that great call America America God shed his grace.
grace on thee and crown thy good with brother from sea to shining sea. Thank you so much. As we, as we go forth today and every day, let me encourage you again to remember those who have served and made the sacrifice for the freedoms we enjoy today. At the same time, give thanks to God also for Jesus Christ and His willingness to serve his commitment to our spiritual freedom and our eternal salvation. And then be confident in your daily faith battles. Knowing that you are equipped by God to be that faithful warrior. That soldier of the cross that makes a difference in the world around. The need for a, a military force will more than likely never disappear. And it's through our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, our marines, that we have the luxury of unprecedented freedoms on this earth. But remember, only Christ can grant the freedom from sin that his sacrifice has guaranteed us and which has been granted to us because we believe in him. May God bless each and every one of you and may God bless America. Let's pray together. Father, once again, we lift our hearts and our voices to you to say thank you for this day. Thank you for the men and women in all areas of our service who have given their lives for our freedom. Father, we do not take them for granted and help us to remember every day the sacrifices that have been made. And then, Father, help us to rejoice and the knowledge of knowing that your son paid the ultimate sacrifice for us, giving us again our freedom to live for you, to live with you, to be with you eternally in heaven, and to make a difference in this world around us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. God bless y'all. Have a great Memorial Day.